all the text for that is you can do that. You can do this one in every 30 times. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that had the alt text for this, this XKD, XKCD is great. Um, my name is Brad Lotsky. Um, I have the privilege of uh, working at Craigslist these days. Um, you probably have heard of us once or twice before. Uh, we write Perl. We do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I'm part of a, a team of about 50 people total in the company. That's everyone. Uh, it's great to be a part of a small team. If you'd like to join our team and make it slightly larger but not too big, uh, come talk to me. Um, we'd love to have you. So this presentation is something that I've been mulling around in my head for a really long time. Um, be, how many of you guys write command line tools in Perl, right? And how many of you want other people to use those things? How many people actually have a lot of people using those things? Yeah, it, it make crossing that gap is really difficult. Um, and I was able to do that recently uh, to get people to use my, my um, command line tools. So I wanted to share some of the shortcuts that I learned, some best practices. Uh, these may not work for you, but they, they worked for me. Uh, so I'm going to be pedantic and stick to them. So what is the command line interface? Um, we're talking about stuff that you run from terminal, from shell. Um, personally, the, I prefer not using a mouse. I like to be able to keyboard in. And once I can keyboard something, the really key piece here is that computers can run it for me. Um, if it's a command line tool and it accepts arguments that I can type in on my keyboard, then I can script it away and put it into cron. Then I don't have to do it. So if something happens in the middle of the night and sets off an alert and I have a tool for that, I can have the computer run the tool instead of me, which means I get to stay sleeping, which is awesome. So there's a number of different things that we talk about when we talk about command line interfaces. Um, you, how many people have done stuff with curses or in curses? Yeah, that stuff is awesome for what it does, but that's not really what I'm talking about here because so most of that stuff really can't be automated away very easily. Um, there's GNU Readline, which is great for when you're writing command line utilities because th that provides you with a, a buffer that you can then um, scroll through in your navigational history. If you've ever been using command line utility and you can hit the up arrow and you can see something else that you've, you've typed before, that's GNU Readline. It's pretty neat. Um, it functions on standard in, standard out, standard error. Oh, Centered out twice, but that's a standard error right there. Um, and sometimes they require uh, clarification or interaction with the user. Um, the, that's typically what a command line interface uh, will look like. The Unix philosophy, of course, is, is one of the key tenets is do one thing well. Uh, so try not to make these gigantic programs um, that are hard to debug and even harder to document. Um, do one thing, do it well. Um, and then other people will flock to it. Enable composability. This is something that's come out of like, I, I don't know if you guys have heard of the hashtag monitoring sucks, hashtag monitoring love um, movements, but composability is a really big issue. I need to be able to take my data and get it to your program. Maybe that's through typing something, but sometimes I have gigabytes of data I want to pipe through your program. I need to be able to get it in, and then I need to be able to get it out and send it somewhere else. Because your utility may do one thing well, but I am, I'm basically composing a workflow with command line interfaces most of the time. And that workflow can't be broken up. Generally speaking, the data out should be in a column format. That way I can pipe it through awk or sed or do whatever I want to. Um, and if you can't do that, at least give me a well-documented plugin API for your command line utility because it may do exactly what you want it to do and it's that close to doing exactly what I need it to do, but without the ability for me to come in and change that behavior just a little bit, um, I'm, I can't use your utility and I'm gonna create mine. And then we'll have two competing things, right? Another standard. And this is, this is key. Um, how many people have ever used, uh, have ever gone into a community channel and asked for help on IRC or Slack or a mailing list? And what's the first thing that someone says? Read the documentation. Well, guess what? If you want other people to start using your utility and you don't want to keep typing in the same thing over and over again in IRC, you need good documentation. You should write this while you're writing your program. Some people say write it before, uh, but I, my, my process is I write it as I'm making changes. That way I understand exactly what it is I'm attempting to accomplish and can sanity check myself, get up, walk, get a coffee, come back and realize, oh yeah, I need to write this code. Um, support dash dash help. If you're not going to support dash dash manual as well, help should just give me a quick overview of what I need to do to run your program. And manual should give me the, I really want to dig in here and figure this out. Um, tell your users where to go for more information. How many people are, use GitHub? 
there's a wiki in GitHub. You don't have to do any web design. You can start writing your documentation online and point people to it directly from the um, command line. And this is also really relevant, is write a blog post or something about what it is you're doing, especially if it's saving you time. If you're doing something in your infrastructure that's saving you time, everyone has the same problems you have. Write about it, share it with other people. You may find out that your utility sucks and there's someone that's doing it way better, but isn't that a net win for everyone? Now you can contribute to that project. So this, this may be a bit of an ego hit for some people. I know it was for me to find out, oh, somebody did that better than I did. But then I could contribute to that project and that made me feel good. Please put example use cases in the documentation. Tell me what you expect when you're running the tool. What do you expect to see? I don't know how many, docu how many documents I've read where you end up with this. Start, when to start. Stop, when to stop. What do you want there? Do you want an interval? Do you want a duration? Do you need to be ISO 8601? Can I say three minutes ago? Can I, what do you want? Show me. Show me how you run the tool. Show me some results that you get when you run the tool. You know, you may need to anonymize the data. That's fine. But just show me what it is that you're trying to accomplish with this tool so I can read through the documentation real quick and go, yes, this fits my use case. So we have a lot of CLI tools in Perl. Um, so how do we get them out there? Um, we, they're all over the place. Like We are the glue that holds the internet together, right? That's, that's kind of what the Perl community does. Um, your use case may be incredibly specific, and you may think you're a snowflake. But from my discussions with other people at conferences, we're all facing the same problems. Um, and no matter how specialized you think that tool is, if you're able to, right, there's no business logic in your code and you're not going to expose any intellectual property, put it up on CPAN. That's what CPAN's there for. There's even a namespace for it. You can just drop stuff in there and you can upload scripts. You don't have to upload full modules. You can upload scripts with tests. You can upload scripts that contain uh, modules that help you build that script. Um, get it out there. Um, so. Here's, here's one example of something that you can do in your code that will enable a Unix type workflow. This is a magic diamond. Um, I'm sure, how many people have used this before? It's nice because it doesn't break conventions with the rest of the Unix utilities. It just flows with the, the, the Unix utilities and I can do what I want to do. Um, and, and I know that I can use this in, in a chain with some Python tools, maybe I need a Ruby tool, maybe I just have a shell script I need, and I can continue along that path without it having any, any problems. For those who don't know, this does exactly what it says here on the slides, and it allows you to read input from files um, or have that input come across in standard into the program. So it's kind of a shortcut, saves you writing some code. Um, Maybe it's a little bit lazy, maybe it's not greatest practice, but this will save you a lot of time uh, creating a very useful utility. Use GitOp Long Descriptive if you can. Um, if you haven't played with GitOp Long Descriptive, it's kind of nice. It lets you document your options as you're writing your code. It also supports the ability to validate those parameters, um, and then it gives you the usage text that you can then output. So running that will generate something like this um, from here, you can see one of the nice things about this is that it can read the optional um, delegation. So here I have server or s, and then when I see the output, it actually shows me the short option is dash s. Um, and this, this is actually directly from the man page of GitOp Long Descriptive. Because they have good documentation, I could just copy and paste it. So this is not my work. This is GitOp Long Descriptive. Um, pod usage is also really cool. I use pod, um, I'll use GitOp Long Descriptive to do the dash dash help on my program, and then I'll tend to use pod usage for the dash dash manual, which is the real in-depth, you know, dig in, uh, run, running with full less. Um, pod usage has some options. You can have it specify an arbitrary message. Uh, you can set the exit flag, so if somebody has used the program incorrectly, you can send them a message and set the exit code to one or something other than zero. Um, if your program is going to exit with an error, set the return code to something other than zero, um, and be clear about what you consider an error and a, something that is not an error uh, in your program. Uh, term read line is pretty easy to use. I'm not gonna go through the example use cases. You can 
pull up the Perl documentation on it, I was able to convert stuff to use term read line pretty quickly. And like I said, all that gives you is the ability to name a buffer and then have me be able to scroll using the up and down arrows through previous values I've entered in there, which could save me thousands of lines of co uh, typing a year. And as someone once told me, we have a finite number of keystrokes before we die. So if, if you can use this, please do. Uh, Term anti-color, so this is a hotly debated item in the Unix world about whether or not color is cool, and I don't really care uh, what your opinion is. What I do care about is if I'm looking at massive amounts of data, color can be an amazing indication of that something has changed as time is going on. When I look at colored log files, I have a better understanding of what has happened on that because we're pattern we, we are programmed program to recognize patterns, and color is one of the best indicators for our brains to be able to detect change. So I highly recommend if you are using a, if you're writing a command line utility that outputs anything, you give your users the ability to output on color based on, well, it's your utility. But if something is going to change, if something is of greater or lesser importance, not all the words we write are as important as the other ones, use color in that designation. Give the users the ability to turn it off, but make it available. Is there a question? Make color the sole determinator whether or not something is Correct. Do not make color the sole determinator is a good point. Um, you, there's some really interesting stuff with um, simulating color blindness that you might want to uh, snuggle up to if you're going to get really, you know, if this is a critical utility in your infrastructure that you need to understand because green and red are often the colors we use to indicate success or failure. And for people who are colorblind, those can be look identical on the screen. So understand what it is you're trying to convey with color, but please make it available um, so that we can make use of it. You could even support theming if you really wanted to get into it so that people can select different colors, even grayscale would help out. Oh, the other thing you can do is, is possibly check, um, you know, to, to put the nail in the coffin of debate, I hate color, I don't want to ever see it. Check the user's .git config. How many people use git here? How many people have a .git config that says to turn color on automatically? Right? So if I have a utility that I'm writing, I can check your git config because it's probably there. And it, if it is, I can just take your color preference and apply it. If you specify dash dash color or dash dash no color, I'll honor that. But if you don't specify anything, I'm going to check first to make sure that my experience matches your expectations. Because if your program doesn't have color and I use color in my git config, I'm, I'm instantly losing a layer of user interface. Uh, there's some other really great modules if you're writing command line utilities. Um, I didn't know about these when I started um, writing uh, command line utilities. So I made a lot of mistakes that aren't made. Um, a lot smarter people than me wrote these things. Um, and they're insanely useful. The file namespace in core is great. It gives you cross-platform uh, functionality right out of the box. So how do you join a file and a directory name together? Well, it depends on what operating system you're on. And file spec will take care of that for you. So you can just specify the path as an array and let it handle it based on the system that the, that Perl is running on. Um, you get the, then you get cross-platform for free for at least that part of it. Um, app command is a great way to glue together a bunch of like disparate utilities into a single user interface. Um, and then each basically each command is its own module. Um, and those modules then become available via the app command uh, main uh, script, which is really a lot of fun. Dissilla is great for pushing things to CPAN. Um, I used to think that pushing something to CPAN was a, you know, and recommending other people, there's a very high uh, barrier to entry on that. Dissilla has taken that away completely. There's no excuse to, to not be contributing to CPAN with Dissilla in, in the game. So check it out. Uh, Podweaver helps with the documentation bits. I never have to write the same documentation twice, especially with this cool plugin called Section Collect from Other, which allows me to use pod from another module in the documentation of my command line script. So if I have a command that I'm putting together that its arguments are parsed by multiple modules, I can pull those arguments from multiple documents or multiple modules into a single pod at the time that this thing is created and ship that in a complete, these are all the arguments that are supported. Very nice. Um, and then I created this thing called CLI helpers. And I'm probably going to run out of time before I get to the end of this. So I have six minutes to do this, but this is something that I reached for constantly and never really found. Um, so I have some input things. I, I wanted to use Damien Conway's IO prompt. But then there's IO prompter, and some of them are supported on Perl 5. 
eight, some of them are, don't work on Perl 5, so there's, there's Perl 510 and beyond, and um, it got really confusing to me, and I have users using this on Red Hat stock five, CentOS 5.8, my utilities, and I need to support them. So I just threw together the simplest pieces that I needed out of that into a module and provide that via an export for input. So here I can confirm, do you want to do, this is an important thing too, if you're about to take a destructive action, regardless of how sure you are the user wants to take that action, they should have to specify dash dash yes on the command line or confirm that destructive action. Make sure you follow that type of modality. This just makes it simple. Confirm, are you sure that you want to do this? Otherwise we die. Um, do you want a, a menu? This generates uh, a menu of colors for you to pick from. Um, looks something like this. Uh, if an invalid selection is given by the user, it just repeats the menu and tells them, sorry, invalid selection, please, please try again. Um, use it as a hash, and then instead of getting the, va the, the name back, you get um, the short value that you've specified. That looks like this. You move north if I push one. Um, it, it provides a validate hookback, so you can say, run this subroutine against it. If, it. if it returns true, then accept it. Otherwise, redraw the prompt again. Um, it's not a valid integer, so you see here, not an integer. And finally, we get three. Um, and then for output, this is really kind of core for me, because I work primarily on the op side of the house um, with my leg in both, both sides of the house, the dev and ops, but uh, mostly in ops. Um, I want to be able to control how, what I saw when I was running programs. Um, so CIL helpers automatically injects these into um, the get options loop. Um, so you, these are the options that you can specify. They're pretty standard across uh, what you would expect. Uh, dash dash verbose is aliased is dash V, so you can do dash V, 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 and you get increasing verbosity. Um, here's a simple example using output um, and a verbose call with an indentation. Um, you know, this, this was in, if you're in the middle of a loop and you need to keep incrementing that, that counter and pushing output further over, you can just keep track of where you are and do plus plus and then you can get that. Here's an example of running it without verbose and then running it with verbose. You can say color, um, set the color to anything that Termancy color reads. Um, if you have nothing in your git config for color, you don't get anything. If you have your uh, UI color set to auto, you'll see it in blue. You can set something as sticky, so this is useful for like warnings or errors. You can say that they're sticky, so after they've been output in the main text of the program, if a million lines go by, I miss that, display them again at the end if they're really Im important. So this will send that message twice to the screen. Once when you, you run it, uh, once when it hits that loop, and then again at the end block for this program. Um, you can do debug statements. Um, they accept all the options that everything else does, and you get you know, increasing amounts of uh, verbosity doing this. Um, you can set the debug class. So you can use the CLI helpers in your modules and then set debug class equal to the class you want to actually turn on debugging on. That way, if it, by, by default, it will only debug if it's called from the main context. If you use this, then you can see into your modules um, if you're building more complex stuff. Um, so here's one that I love because I write, again, I'm a systems person, I tend to write cron jobs. Um, if you specify dash dash syslog, um, you'll receive output to standard out, and you'll also receive um, that message via syslog. It does some magic to you know, build the, the syslog tag. You can specify that manually. Uh, if you want to, it's in the options. Um, and then you can do stuff like this. You can say a quiet and syslog, and it'll do the right thing. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I wanted to do was to be able to take input from one program and move it to the next program. Uh, but sometimes these are long-running things, and I, I, needed, I needed to be able to write them out to a, a file and um, come back to that later. So I have a, an option in here called data. So if you have a line that you consider a data row, you just tag it as saying it's data. And then when you run this and specify dash dash data file, all those lines that you have tagged as data will be written uh, to that data file. Nothing else will be. Um, but that way you can then use that data file uh, for something else later. Here's a few of the options that the output um, uh, specifies in that hash reference that comes first if you decide to use it. Um, seen a few of these in, in some of these uh, presentations. I, I guess the, the one is important, which regardless of whether or not the user is using dash dash quiet, uh, if you tag a message as important, it will always be displayed to the screen. And I wrote documentation for it, so you can check it out and tell me how terrible it is. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you, guys.
Are there any questions? We have like 30 seconds. Yeah. Thank you. Huh? Probably. Yeah, I, 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 tend to, I tend to support older versions all the way back to 5.8. Um, with a lot of the utilities I write, so, so you may see some non-modern Perl every once in a while, just because newer versions of Perl don't don't support it yet. You'd be surprised; those people are the first to write bug reports on GitHub if they're using your utilities on older versions of Perl, and they're just locked in. Uh, so you, I try to do my best to make it still accessible to the to people locked into older versions of Perl. Um, I wish I did. I wish I didn't have to, but I, I feel like that's getting it getting some of the utilities more traction. Any other questions? Testing, testing is tricky. The question is, how do you do testing if you're um, if you're constantly relying on interactivity uh, from the, the command prompt? It, it's difficult. Um, I have to say, I've passed on some of that stuff um, myself and relied on um, just bug reports uh, where there is a high level of interactivity that's required. Um, but you could, you know, <laughs> use expect to be able to generate that output or that input to the program and then make sure that it, it handles things. Um, or just for those interactive pieces, make sure that those are testable components themselves and don't rely on the, don't test the interactivity, test the functionality. Uh, and that, that is, um, that's where I've been leaning towards these days is just basically focusing on what is this thing supposed to do? What is this function supposed to do when it gets called by the user? I can't control when the user calls it, but let me make sure that it does the right thing. Any other questions? Cool, thanks guys.